Hepinize günaydın. Good morning. All. We would like to welcome you to our conference Istanbul 1914-1922 War, Collapse, Occupation and the History of Resistance. Today and tomorrow we will have very distinguished panelists with us. More than 20 panelists will be with us delivering their presentations. I would like to thank our scientific committee, the organization committee, all our panelists and all our moderators. Likewise, we would like to thank the French Embassy, the US Consulate, Etkinis EU program, and Friedrich Ebert Stiftung for their generous support of the conference. Before we proceed with the panel sessions, I would like to make a short reminder. We will be live broadcasting this conference. All presentations, including the Q&A session, will be live streamed through the YouTube channel of the Herantink Foundation, as well as our social media accounts. If uh, our audience are concerned uh, about uh, being in the footage, you may also follow the sessions in the foyer. There will also be simultaneous English-Turkish interpretation. Uh, if you need interpretation uh, services, you can also uh, take your headsets uh, from the foyer. And we would like to thank all our uh, viewers and participants, those also watching us online. And uh, on that note, I would like to invite uh, Ms. Rakelding, president of the Herantink Foundation, for her opening remarks. Good morning. Distinguished guests, dearest friends, Coming together face to face uh, in, in hell today is, is wonderful and it's very precious. I would like to welcome you all to our conference. As the Herantink Foundation since 2009, we have been holding international conferences to explore socio-economic uh, characteristics of various regions to the extent possible we uh, visit those regions and we uh, make collaborations with the uh, local actors and local authorities there because of the covid pandemic uh, we could not hold face-to-face -face conferences for two years uh, and this year we are resuming our conference sessions uh, where we will also be live streaming this year, we chose Istanbul as the main topic of the conference. Here, we also wanted to include panelists who can tell us narratives other than the official uh, discourse. So we have historians, uh, sociologists, university students, and academics, as well as practitioners. Our ultimate aim is to uh, provide a platform for new studies, which will help us to better understand the past and we would like to also contribute to democratization agenda. As uh, Jesus Christ said, then you will know the truth, and truth will set you free. During this conference, we will be elaborating on the past and present of Istanbul. And as we will be doing so, one uh, cannot help but question uh, of uh, the people whose uh, doors were knocked on on April 24th. How many people uh, were rounded up on April 24th? Uh, how many people had to live in fear? So every social and economic events would leave their psychological impact too. Many years ago, uh, I listened to a speaker about the lure and lethality of lies. Just one example, in, in Russia, in order to hunt wolves, uh, they would put blood around uh, the um, swords and they would put stick the helm into the war and then the wolf uh, would be deceived, uh, lick its own blood uh, and cut its own uh, tongue uh, and will ultimately die. So this is a very good uh, illustration of uh, the journey of denial. Knowing the truth is very important. Unfortunately, we are holding this conference where dozens of our friends uh, are in jail for speaking out the truth. I would like to thank all our uh, colleagues, scientific committee members, uh, primarily Professor Ayhan Aktaş, 
uh, for their generous contribution to this conference, and I would like to once again thank all our panelists and participants. We would like to thank Raquel Dink, and now we will proceed with the opening, uh, opening intervention, opening speech by Mr. Ayhan Akhtar. Uh, his intervention is titled, My Pasha, Why Did We Enter to This War? And uh, Professor Akhtar is also the head of the scientific committee of this conference. I believe you can hear me right now. It's on June 28, 1914, uh, is the day that marked the beginning of the First World War. Uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand uh, was assassinated along with his wife, which paves the way uh, for the war, uh, which was uh, followed by uh, Germany, uh, Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire, and Bulgaria uh, aligned with one another. And uh, on the other hand, we have uh, UK, France, and uh, Tsarist Russia and Italy. Of course, this assassination had its repercussions in the Ottoman capital. However, uh, the real uh, efforts to try to be part of this alliance indeed started uh, in March uh, 1914. We would like to also uh, look into what happened before the past because the Ottoman Empire lost 83% uh, of its territories in, in uh, Rumelia and uh, 69 of its population. And of course, this has caused a significant trauma. And after the war, during the peace negotiations, after the Balkan Wars, uh, in 1913, uh, during the peace negotiations, there was a hearsay that uh, Edirne, Adrianopol, will be left to Bulgarians. And uh, Enver Bey, uh, who hears about this, starts working on a plot, and he comes to the uh, Ottoman uh, administration house, and together with his Fedais, uh, he would just raid into the building, and Nazım Pasha, uh, the war minister of the time, uh, walks over the uh, Fedais, and he was also being killed. And later on, uh, Kamil Pasha resigns. Interpreters cannot hear as the microphone is switched off. Should I have some onion? Okay, take it. Olem, take it. Doğu bölgelerinde, Doğu ana. In eastern regions, eastern. Uh, part of uh, Ottoman Empire, there was the discussions about Islahat reform and reorganization, which was first discussed during the Berlin uh, Congress. And according to the 61 article of Berlin uh, Agreement, the Ottoman government accepted uh, to make a commitment uh, uh, for uh, reform and reorganization uh, in provinces with Armenian population and to also guarantee safety and security of uh, Armenians uh, against uh, the backdrop of circassians and Kurds. And in the second half of the 19th century, uh, 
there was the other issue of the uh, land and uh, through a land reform uh, the right to have private property was recognized and through this way the uh, tribal culture of the eastern provinces uh, were challenged as uh, the tribes uh, have also now become taxpayers then all the meadows and pastures uh, were registered as the property of the populations, so they have become landlords. And as they became landlords, as Kurdish tribes became landlords, many agricultural workers, Armenians, Syrians, Assyrians, uh, they uh, also lost their lands because these lands were then registered uh, on the landlords and many of the local population involved in agriculture activities they left uh, eastern anatolia they left for the us and and russia and in this way uh, eastern anatolia uh, and its demographic demographic started change along with uh, taxation policies along with the pressures and losing and it also uh, marks the start of the process of seizing of uh, properties. And this is how uh, Armenian political organizations uh, start to get organized and uh, they also make efforts to uh, arm, uh, to take up arms. And around that time, Abdul Hamid has a project that they would, that he wanted to use Kurds uh, as a buffer zone against a possible uh, uh, Tsarist Russia uh, move in Eastern Anatolia. However, the villagers, Armenian, Assyrian, and Kurdish villagers would think that they would be able to uh, rescue themselves from these pressures. And in those days, apparently, there were certain clashes. However, uh, people, villagers, had friendly relations. There were also certain exceptions that there were some people and groups who could exert their pressure. And then there were others who had to suffer because of this pressure, in other words, uh, Kurdish, Turkish, and Armenian villagers. This is an account of uh, uh, Mehmet Celal Bey, who was appointed as the governor to Erzurum. After 1908, uh, after the constitutional period, not much has been done, apparently, but uh, local people uh, and civic actors of the time, they start making reports and submitting this report to the capital. They uh, take record of the number of monasteries, churches, cemeteries. They register uh, 13 monasteries, 27 churches, and uh, more than 7,000 properties. By the way, uh, these numbers do not include a small, smaller uh, plots of lands uh, that are uh, smaller than uh, 100 hectares. After 1912, the Ottoman government allocates a certain funds uh, in order for compensation to be paid to these villagers. However, uh, with the uh, outbreak of the Balkan Wars, uh, the funds allocated for compensation uh, had to be reallocated towards spendings. Meanwhile, uh, Sazano, a Russian foreign minister of the time, asks for reform in eastern provinces. And he was particularly uh, concerned about two issues. There are Armenians in eastern Anatolia, and there are also Armenians in the Caucasus under our administration. So if there is certain revolt uh, by Armenians in eastern Anatolia, then we will also feel the impact in our Russian territories. So this would be a matter of national security concern for Russia. And then uh, Ottoman Sefirs, uh, Turhan Pasha, uh, also reports that to the cap capital. 
And in 1913, uh, uh, summer, Austria, uh, Germany, France, uh, UK, Italy, Russia, their uh, diplomatic corps uh, convened in Yeniköy at the summer residence of Austrian uh, embassy. And during that meeting in 1913, they discussed the six provinces in the uh, in the eastern part of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they uh, decide on appointing a foreigner inspector to these provinces, that there would be equal numbers of Armenians and, and Muslims in uh, administrative and uh, military cadres. Uh, also, Armenians and Muslims will have equal share in uh, security forces and the uh, city councils. This was followed by negotiations. Uh, Javid Bey, the Minister of Finance of the time, was in Paris uh, in an attempt to find uh, loans. And he had a meeting with uh, Count Alexander Izvolsky, uh, the Russian ambassador in Paris, and he and Javid Bey tells uh, Izvolsky about his opinion about this, uh, about this Eastern reformation plan. So he asks uh, a kinder approach uh, from the Russian part. So this project to be implemented in Eastern provinces may also be implemented in Arab provinces, in other words, in, in uh, the province of uh, Syria of the time. So, because of all these pressures uh, and uh, seizing of properties and massacres, the Armenian leadership uh, comes up with a proposal at the Armenian Council. They decide to seek foreign support. And in 1912, December 21st, uh, they make a decision approved by all uh, Armenian uh, parties and organizations that uh, they will uh, take this reform discussion uh, to the attention of the international community. And in a very short period of time, uh, Katalikos of Ejmiadzin, uh, Kevork V, uh, applies to the general governor of Russia in Caucasus uh, and in this way, they asked the Russian administration to also take ownership of the Armenian question and uh, to help uh, Armenians raise the issue uh, before European uh, states. And now we can see that during the reform uh, negotiations, uh, Talat Bey, the interior minister of the time, starts negotiating with high level uh, Armenian uh, politicians were also members of the CUP. And uh, during these discussions, Talat Bey uh, makes certain recommendations, uh, almost threatening that, uh, you sh that Armenians uh, should give up on this support. So these negotiations, unfortunately, uh, do not result in any progress. We can see that the tension was rising, and uh, Yeniköy agreement was signed on uh, 8 of February 1914. Uh, it was signed by Said Talim Pasha, and also charge d'affaires of, Fer of uh, Russia in Istanbul, Konstantin Gulkevich. So this is the uh, this agreement is also. Uh, known as the Shark uh, Islahatı, is reformation in the eastern provinces. It has six uh, articles, six provisions. Eastern uh, Anatolia will be divided in two administrative parts. There will be um, general inspectors. Uh, they will be overseeing all administrative and judicial affairs, uh, all uh, uh, public documents will be drafted uh, in local languages, Armenian, Turkish, and Kurdish. City councils will have uh, members uh, 
and membership will be uh, on an equal basis. Uh, there will be equal numbers of Armenian deputies and Muslim deputies. I mean, of course, this is a very harsh plan uh, for capital for Istanbul in, in 1913 or 1914. And this document also clearly limits uh, Ottoman uh, sovereignty in eastern provinces. But what was the reason for this uh, plan uh, to be signed? The lobbying activities started by uh, Boz Nubar Pasha could convince uh, the British, French, and Russian uh, dignitaries of the time. And through that, the loan agreement could be offered to Turkey. If you look into the memoirs of Vahan Papazian, as a result of this pressure, Ottomans understood that they would not be able to receive any loans from Europeans, and this obliged them to sign these uh, Eastern Provinces Reformation Plan. And then there was also a certain threat from Russia. Russia said, unless you sign the plan, uh, we will be uh, entering your territories. And this is how Armenians saw Russia as a savior or a guarantor for the Armenian communities in eastern provinces. But there is yet another serious problem at that time. Russian industrialization at the time completely relied on the grain uh, transported via vessels uh, passing the uh, straits. And in 1912, uh, Russia Russia's uh, exports uh, reduced 30% because of the uh, Balkan Wars with significant reduction of uh, Russia's export revenues. And against the backdrop of these tensions, Russia, uh, Russia wanted to have a regime that would keep the straits open for exports and for a vessel passage. Mahmoud Shevket Pasha had an agreement with Germans at the same time. And as a result, uh, General Limon von Sanders uh, uh, and uh, German military officers uh, arrived in Turkey, which was a major concern with Russia, too. After this, there was a meeting of military council where a decision was taken that if there would be the need, uh, military uh, office officers uh, would be prepared for any possible landing on the straits. This was a decision by the Russian uh, Security Council of the time. And they would both prepare the army, and they would also allocate up to 50,000 uh, rubles uh, for uh, invading the Istanbul Strait. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, when we look into the memoirs of uh, Kazım Karabekir Bey, uh, he hints that uh, Europeans already shared this intelligence about Russian plans to Ottomans. And we, no one really talks about the uh, Russian-Ottoman War of 1878. People would only talk about Aya Stefanos' agreement, but uh, Aya Stefanos is uh, today's Yeshilköy, which means that Russians uh, came all the way to Yeshilköy. 18 days after the start of the First World War, Ottoman officers uh, blew up a Russian uh, monument, which was uh, which was installed in Aya Stefanos uh, in Yeshilköy, uh, as uh, Russians uh, constructed this monument during their uh, advance in Aya Stefanos. Then comes a very interesting occasion. Uh, Russian chas would normally uh, travel to Yalta to their uh, summer dochas. Uh, that summer, they went to uh, Yalta. 
daughter and every time a Tsar visits Crimea an Ottoman uh, official would be dispatched to Crimea uh, to extend greetings of the Sultan and this time Talat Bey was dispatched to Crimea and they meet Char. Next day there is uh, uh, there is luncheon and it on on Arturul vessel and during that luncheon uh, Talat uh, raises uh, the question how would you see allying with the Ottoman Empire? So in a way, Italat Bey uh, made an effort to somehow reverse Aya Stefano's agreement that was signed recently. And Sazono was taken by surprise. And he complains that uh, what was the reason for the Ottoman government to wait for so long to offer alliance to Russia. But on the other hand, a Russian ambassador uh, to uh, Istanbul uh, takes this seriously. Later on, two inspectors were appointed, uh, Westenang from the Netherlands and uh, Hork from uh, Sweden. Westenang was previously uh, an administrator in Indian islands. Uh, these two inspectors are appointed to serve in Istanbul. They arrived uh, at circuit train station, and the diplomat who uh, came to pick them up uh, advised them not to be so uh, publicly visible out there, and they should not have frequent contacts with the embassy. This was followed by negotiations about the scope of inspectors' mandate. And later on, uh, around May 1914, it became clear that the Ottoman government uh, was indeed making things uh, quite difficult for them. For instance, they don't really pay uh, for the hotel and accommodation expenses of these inspectors. These inspectors needed advisors, uh, yet the uh, Committee of Union Progress members uh, would uh, put their friends as their advisors. And uh, Westenank was more like a diplomat, so he continued negotiations. On the other hand, Hon Hof uh, would go to Trabzon and then to Bitlis. And then Van Governor Tahsin Bey receives an uh, in instruction from Istanbul to assist this person called Hof uh, coming from Istanbul and the first reaction was to ask whether there would be a reception ceremony for this person and um, and the, the person um, does not really want to do this. What does what does this really mean? You might wonder. Now, um, the Ottoman um, bureaucracy um, acted in um, harmony with the local authorities and resisted this reform. The same guy, Tasin, one year later during the Armenian genocide, it was uh, to um, assume a very active role. Microphone, please. Kariyerleri, peki, bunun pili azda. Evet. Fiasko ile sonuçlan. So it ends up in fiasco, and then uh, Talat Bey um, says there is a war starting in Europe, and for this war, 
um, we don't need to do anything, any reforms. Uh, you should go back to the Netherlands and uh, you need to follow up on what's going on from your home. And at the end of the day, what happens is at the end of December, 28th of uh, December 1914, um, this establishment is annulled and uh, these inspectors are recalled and they're, they're no longer um, active out there in the field. Now, let's go back a little. Uh, this assassination in Sar Sarajevo, uh, Kazem Karabakir, uh, responsible for intelligence, is in Paris when this assassination takes place and um, realizes the gravity of the situation and gets back to Istanbul and tells Enver Pasha um, that you know that that is that or or asks whether there's an alliance with uh, the Germans and and by looking at these relations, we thought that there, there was um, an alliance. The, the, the Germans know our operational plans and so on and so forth. And um, the, the answer is no, we don't have any such formal alliance. And that is true. At first, there is no such official alliance. The second constitutional period, the second constitutional period, uh, is being celebrated at the Levant uh, farm. There's a there's a, um, a progression, and Paul Fangenheim, uh, the ambassador, German ambassador, um, talks to high-ranking uh, officers of the Ottoman forces and says, "I've talked uh, with my counterparts. The Kaiser uh, has been convinced. We can uh, initiate this uh, alliance formally." So at that time. Uh, actually, one week before that incident, Jamal Pasha uh, went to um, France and they also proposed an alliance uh, to them, but um, they, they didn't take up on the offer. He came back to Istanbul quite demoralized and, um, and the, the, the fact that the Germans accepted this proposal of an alliance was a lifeline for the Unionists. And everyone um, is not um, feeling like uh, Enver or Talat. Javid Bey, for instance, um, on the 2nd of August goes to the office of Salit Halim Pasha and uh, feels that something is amiss. The interpreter of the uh, German embassy is there and asks what is going on. And they, they say that they cannot say because they're under oath. Uh, the minister asks the question and the other minister says they cannot answer the um, question. And then Said Halim Pasha uh, reads out the articles of alliance and Javid Bey, first of all, remains silent. And then um, he thinks to himself and um, in the face of the Russian incursion says that Turkey is unable to uh, react um, and that th the country would end in ruins and the Ottoman Empire would be obliterated from the face of the map. And uh, Talat Bey says, so what? Uh, this has been done, uh, the, 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 it has already been signed and that's how it's supposed to be. And, and of course, um, he puts this in his diary. Um, this is quite a vital matter for the state and this is the attention that um, they have uh, spared to this incident. So he's quite critical of, of um, how this decision came to pass. And after this decision, so a series of interesting events take place. The next day, mobilization uh, uh, mobilization is announced and um, um, state of... Um, um, state of emergency is announced and the civilian um, realm uh, begins to shrink and Enver Pasha is at the helm of this um, uh, process and he becomes nothing short of a dictator as a result. And uh, Yasemi, um, historian, diplomacy historian, microphone please. Arkasından, uh, and then um, circumvents the um, issue um, to, to instigate this internal coup. Çok sağ ol. 
And on paper, the Ottoman uh, monarchical system is a constitutional monarchy. There is a constitution, there is the Sultan, there is the Assembly. Uh, the Assembly is responsible for legislation. The Sultan is responsible for approving a piece of legislation. There is a government. But um, I since January uh, 13, um, this is not in place. There is a coup government. And the the the, the, the so-called government uh, runs the runs the um, the show. The CUP um, government um, reports to uh, CUP bureaucrats and um, members of the uh, armed forces, and that's what they do. And the Grand National Assembly is on recess after this mobilization. And Enver Pasha um, established a unit and says um, and. Everything uh, will be uh, dealt w from here, the correspondence of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, for instance, and this um, proves um, quite controversial. This constant, uh, concentration of power is like a triumvirate. Uh, Envar Talat Pasha uh, are actually Halel Menteshe, Speaker of the Parliament. Uh, th th this is the triumvirate. Uh, these three act in harmony, and uh, Sadrazam is quite malleable. Salit Alim Pasha um, is is quite malleable, and um, the uh, opposition has um, been largely silenced. So you see the triumvirate here: Talat Halil and Said Halim Pasha. Now. And um, members of the armed forces, they say, uh, yes, uh, we're not, we, there's this mobilization, but we're not ready for war warfare. Our troops are not trained enough. We don't have rifles, um, artillery, ammunition. So you need to at least give us eight months so that we can prepare for warfare. And on the 8th of August, um, after this agreement, alliance agreement, which was actually kept uh, secret, and you know people were under oath to not reveal it. In Tallinn paper, newspaper, um, Zia Gökalp publishes an article um, about how um, Turkey's ambitions um, are quite high, and it's you know actually warmongering, and. Um, this is shared b with Talat Pasha, and um, and his instructions uh, was to actually um, not publish such articles. Um, Talat Pasha calls them up, and, and I mean the uh, high-ranking officers of the armed forces in the general staff, and um, so they are told not to uh, publish such articles. Um, we need to prepare the public uh, for war. That is our responsibility, is the response that they get. In Bandarma, two um, MPs, uh, CUP MPs, uh, um, organize a conference, and at that time, um, the um, Major Jafar Bey says that if we uh, um, go into war, it would be a catastrophe. Again, uh, this guy is um, um, sort of um, admonished by the Istanbul administration. Mustafa Kemal Bey is an attaché militaire in uh, Bosnia at the time, and this is the letter he sends uh, to Salih Bozok. Uh, we should not side with the Germans um, because they are fighting at two um, uh, fronts, and it is not possible for them to win this war. And I do not believe in a German triumph, um, he says. And in the same letter, or a similar letter, is also sent to uh, Rushto Aras Bey, a longer version, and. Um, he says we should um, not side with anyone, and um, doctor d does what he does. Um, he does his best, but nevertheless, um, they do not really achieve anything. And then, um, a couple of years later, um, Mustafa Kemal writes um, a telegram from Sivas uh, to Istanbul, and this is the final part, which is quite interesting. Four pri months prior to our entering the war, um, um, they announced that they wanted to establish an Armenian state in contravention with um, the interests of the um, Ottoman um, government. And as per the um, secret agreements of Bolsheviks, uh, Istanbul w w was going to be given to Russia. That's why um, it was unavoidable uh, for, for us to enter this war. So, um, February f uh, 14, Erenköy Agreement, uh, 
is actually was actually a very important turning point for CUP and this agreement to, in order not to implement this agreement they actually entered this this war is what we can surmise um, now Goben and Breslau these came to the um, Istanbul uh, port these fled the uh, British um, f uh, fleet uh, people thought, but no, uh, Enver Pasha wanted these to be sent, and Kaiser Wilhelm sent these. So there's a huge diplomatic um, fury uh, when these vessels arrive, and they say that they purchased these vessels, and the staff are Ottoman um, mem servicemen, they say. But you see, um, I mean, how Germans put on fez uh, on their heads and um, got these photographs taken, and all of a sudden they become local, and they become um, Ottoman uh, troops. Now, this shift is observed by the other side, um, and the, the Brits, um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, has to do something because, um, you know, Turkey is sliding towards German. But yes, we are going to um, uh, respect your uh, territorial integrity. Let's guarantee that. And also on top of that, let us make a special arrangement um, because, uh, you know, this mobilized um, army w will come at a cost. We will also cover that cost so that you do not enter the war. And um, in contravention with diplomatic inclinations, um, the uh, London em embassy of the Ottoman Empire, o when he's on, on his way to Istanbul, he's uh, seen off by Lord Grey. And uh, this offer is repeated once again at the train station. And um, the ambassador comes to Istanbul, talks to the Sadrazam, and this is the answer. They are way too late. Uh, we have reached a certain level of um, advancement. We are going to take back Egypt and uh, we are going to um, break uh, the chain imposed on us by Britain. And Sayyid Ali Pasha um, is the grandson of Kavala the um, Pasha and uh, you know conquest of Egypt actually sounds quite quite attractive to him and about Germany there's a lot of uh, correspondence at the time and uh, three days after the alliance um, Enver Pasha um, goes and hundreds of ammunition um, artillery and so on and so forth is requested from the Germans and the general staff talks to Krupp so that th th all all these um, ammunitions can be gathered, but here's the here's the problem that they're confronted with, which is no small feat, from uh, Germany to Austria, Hungary, and then to Bulgaria, and then to Turkey. This is how it's going to come. Romania and Bulgaria are still uh, not um, a part of the war, and how is this ammunition? How are these weapons um, going to cross? their uh, territory and th this territory is full of Russian spies so this is a huge problem and that's why things cannot move very fast and um, you know uh, bribery is involved and Bulgarians are to be um, convinced um, to enter the war and the attaché in Berlin Hasan Cemil Bey um, um, colonel um, is in direct talks with the uh, German general staff and at first uh, things are quite nice but um, things turn, um, take it, uh, turn down south when um, Germans um, are at an advantage. Ottoman um, colonels ask uh, for eight months. Uh, they want to go into war in spring, but uh, Germans want them to enter war immediately. And in, or in terms of preparedness, you need weapons and ammunition, and that is hard to uh, come by. So this is the impasse that they, they find themselves in. Now, right after this, what happens is, when it comes to weapons and, and ammunition, um, you know, th th there's slow progress when it comes to weapons and ammunition, and they make the ultimate decision to enter the war. And Javid Bey, at that time, uh, in order to prevent uh, this foray, as the financial affairs minister um, sort of diminishes funds for the army, and Merpaja wants two million um, Ottoman gold coins and says, I can only give you half a million. Um, I wasn't involved in the decision for the mobilization, is what he says. And um, obviously, um, you know, salaries of high ranking officers are paid in half um, at that time. And at the beginning of, um, uh, well, um, th this presentation, I shared the question with you. Um, my Pasha, why did we enter this, enter this war? And um, 
and this is um, Fali Rifkube and Yakub Kadri. Um, and they actually asked this question on their way to um, um, Buyukada um, when they were having dinner in Buyukada. Um, my Pasha, could you please uh, tell us why we entered this war um, to to find funds? We had to um, do this uh, in order to um, keep on going because our coffers were empty, is what he said. So yes, this is one of the reasons. Javid Bey, despite all his efforts, The entering the war, like I said previously, one of the watershed moments was in um, um, 14, um, February 14, the Yeniköy um, Agreement. Cemal Pasha in his memoirs says that due to the resistance of the Russians, um, we um, wanted to, um, you know, also um, tear apart the Eastern Anatolia Agreement. That's why we entered this war. So this is how um, Ottomans entered the war. And uh, young um, officers who became the founders of the Republic, um, uh, Ismet Inunur was one of them, how how they perceived this? Uh, they, I, I think this process left um, a residue in their heads. Ismet Pasha in his memoirs uh, says that it was possible not to enter the first war. Uh, we could have delayed it even further, he says. Um, we should have protected ourselves more and militaristically. Um, um, there was no rationale for us to uh, enter the uh, First World War. This was indefensible, he says. The Germans uh, lost the war and then we joined them after Mann, uh, he says. So this attitude is actually um, uh, seen again. Um, and he says the parliament didn't know. It was just a triumvirate. Um, that made this decision, he says in his memoirs, which is quite significant. Democratic processes, uh, when they are um, hindered or impeded, uh, people at the top, you know, their dreams, their ambitions um, are at the helm. Um, these big dreams cost millions of people's uh, lives, and this is used as a pretext. And 21, 24, 61, 82 constitutions. In all of these constitutions, it says that the decision for war should be taken at the parliament level, which is no coincidence. Yes, the founders of the republic, the elites, may not say this a lot, but the First World War, entering the First World War, um, is the reason um, behind all these articles in, in these consecutive Turkish constitutions. And finally, allow me to uh, share this um, quite sad um, story with you. The Zeytin da the book called Zeytinda by Fali Rifka Atay, his memoirs of the First World War uh, um, and in 15, uh, 15 uh, the, the Palestine uh, front uh, collapses, uh, the train uh, comes back to Turkey. A mother um, uh, shouts out to the soldiers in the train, have you seen my Ahmed? And uh, the mother, um, the train is on en route to uh, Istanbul, but um, you know the mother shows the other direction and says, "This is where my son went." Fari Ufka says, "The Anadolu um, is Anatolia is looking for his Ahmed. Why did we uh, do away with Ahmed? What have we won um, as a, as a result? How can we make this mother proud?" But unfortunately, we lost Ahmed um, um, as a result of a bet. Now. Um, more than a quarter of a million um, tr troops lost their lives and um, also uh, 1.5 million people uh, became ill, uh, they, uh, they uh, fled the army, they, they, they were lost and also 400,000 people were maimed at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the war. So the decision to enter the war, and this is the human cost of the decision to en enter the war. And I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>